We have, we are delighted to have two specialists in, in this topic. Um, and, um, and we have a one hour panel discussion, the first panel discussion. So th this should be very interactive and, and everyone is very welcome to, to participate. And just to give you a, a bit of a background, um, Dana uh, Harrickson is Associate Professor of Education Leadership and Innovation in the Mary Lou Fulton College at Arizona State University. And she studies the intersection between creativity, technology, and design in education. She's associate editor of Education Policy Analysis at Archives um, and uh, working group leader for a UNESCO um, global consortium um, called Edu Summit of Educational Technology Leaders. And Punya Misra is Associate Dean of Scholarship and Innovation and Professor at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College, Arizona State University, and internationally recognized for his work, again, in technology, integration in teaching, uh, the role of creativity and aesthetics in learning, the application of design-based approaches to educational innovation, author of many, many articles and books, and um, someone who received many millions in, in grants. So we're in excellent hands to be talking about practice and theory and how all these things kind of come together. So I think at the very beginning, I would love for, for uh, starting with Dana to, to have a, a bit of introduction about yourselves and how you got to the topic of creativity, serendipity, and, and the relation to, to education and technology. I don't know, a little, a, little, a little background perhaps. Should we start with you, Dana? Sure, thank you so much, Vlad. And thank you for having us. Um, it's so nice to be here and I see a lot of, uh, familiar faces and friends in the crowd. Um, so, and I apologize, I didn't mean to interrupt you momentarily. I'm having some internet glitchiness issues today, of course. Um, so if there's any slowdowns or anything like that, just let me know. Um, and... We're living through everything, trust me. Yeah. We're... <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, as you said, I'm at Arizona State University and uh, my work on creativity and education really focuses on, I, I always say I'm a bit of a dabbler because I'm interested in so many different areas of creativity in education, um, specifically creative teaching practices and thinking skills. Um, and under that umbrella, I've kind of been able to explore things like the connection between personal and professional creativity, um, transdisciplinary creativity, design thinking, arts-based teaching, uh, most recently mindfulness and creativity. So, um, and my interest in the topic really started from years back, I think for as long as I can remember, I've always been interested in what I would call the craft of work in how people who are really excellent at what they do, um, who do really remarkable things or make great discoveries, how they do that, how they come up with great ideas or how they manage to function so thoughtfully and creatively and do things that are interesting. So that sort of, I, there was kind of a natural progression where I was doing some work in uh, marketing and graphic design many years ago um, for Michigan State University. And I was taking some education classes because I was really interested in um, working in higher education. And my interest with design actually kind of coll collided with Pumia's work in design. So he's the one who kind of sparked this in, um, interest. I was one of his graduate students many years ago. And as soon as I started sort of the formal study of design and education, I was really hooked on that topic on how people create things that are innovative and unique and interesting and that sort of there was a natural progression of um sort of following that into creative teaching everyone that i think of that i know and love is a teacher my mom was a teacher um i have many friends and um uh and students that i work with who are teachers so there was just this sort of fascination with um education the sort of crossword roads of so many different disciplines and all my interests kind of started to tie together there and like that all kind of, I think, leads really nicely into the topic of that we have of serendipity. I was really excited to see that that was sort of the focus of this conference, um, because I think it's an interesting opportunity for us to talk about that idea about where great ideas come from. What what are the inception of um, of unique, novel, effective, interesting ideas and projects and products and artifacts and things that people create uh, in the world. And it's, you know, it's been explored by some of the great minds in the field. Um, and there's still so many different avenues and, and theories and themes to explore. So I think that this experience of engaging in creative action to 
to make or discover something new, whether it's a poem, a painting, a scientific idea, or a mathematical insight, it, it can feel like this aha moment, this unexpected or sort of surprising coming together of ideas and insights. Um, and that doesn't diminish the fact, though, that creativity also involves so much time and work that comes together, that, that putting together, that crafting of making ideas come together and come to life in the real world. Um, but that element of serendipity often features so heavily in the experiences that people have in creative making or discovery. So I thought it might be useful to consider what we mean by serendipity to kind of um, lead us off into this discussion. Um, and kind of put us on the same page. Puni and I are just joining in here um, right now. So I took a minute to look up the common definition, which is that occurrence and development of ideas by chance in a happy or beneficial way. And this really spoke to my personal belief that creativity is transdisciplinary in nature <clears throat> and it's combinatorial, combinatorial so that creative ideas can emerge or come together from this combining of of pre-existing ideas and concepts in these unique, fresh, exciting, original ways. And this speaks to an element of the unexpected where sometimes the creator experiences um, a discovery by this happy accident, by this unplanned creative emergence. Um, so one of the points that I wanted to kind of highlight um, is that we tend to pay a lot of attention to the aha moment itself and to the outcomes and products of the discovery, but there's so much that kind of goes into setting the stage. Um, and I thought it might be useful, if you don't mind, if I just share my screen for a moment to kind of touch on an example, one of my favorite examples of uh, serendipitous creativity. I would um, love examples. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. And actually, I don't see a way to... You the share um, screen. Uh, it should be the, right? Do you, do you see it down in the, the green button? I hope I hope you have it. Um, actually, I have it, but I'm seeing, I think it might be a different version of Zoom. Punya, could you just maybe put the link to the Smithsonian article in the chat and I can, that way everybody can visit it and check it out themselves. What I was going to share was some examples, um, one of my favorite examples of serendipitous creativity from Alexander Fleming, hmm. the scientist who discovered penicillin. Um, and if you have a chance to go to that link um, that Punya is putting in there, um, you'll notice some different drawings or paintings that he made, which um, I love because he actually colored them with bacteria. So in addition to working as a scientist and before he discovered antibiotics, he painted um, and he was a member of like the Chelsea Arts Club and created some just, you know, kind of simple amateurish watercolors, but he also painted using this unusual medium um, of living organisms and he made ballerinas, houses, soldiers, um, and he made these by growing microbes with different natural pigments in the places where he wanted different colors using a petri dish and um, a, you know lab tools and just kind of inoculating sections with different species and he was really just having fun with this kind of artistic play in his lab while he was working um, but it actually is what led him to the discovery of penicillium in one of his paintings and there was a particular painting um, where each of the colonies of the staphylococci bacteria on the plate had grown into this small shape that kind of looked like a planet or a star in the night sky but he also noticed another shape that he didn't expect or that shouldn't have been there, which was kind of what he described as a larger, lighter body in the dish, which turned out to be the penicillium uh, fungus. And he called this his uh, this art discovery, his rising sun or his um, his living masterpiece that went on to actually save a lot of lives. So I always kind of bring that up because it's an example of a, of a discovery that happened because of <clears throat> this habit of creative play that he had and, and developing the artist's eye for the rare. And, you know, other scientists might have seen or probably did see this bacteria growing on Petri dishes at one point, but they had kind of thrown the dishes away as failures. Um, but for him, he had kind of spent this all his life looking for the outliers and situations that favored them. So I always kind of I thought we would bring up that uh, example to kind of set the stage about how habits of mind and habits of creative play, and things that let us just see the world differently can lead to those new ideas. Um, and sort of connects with my favorite quote on this topic from Louis Pasteur, that chance favors only the prepared mind. So then Punya was gonna introduce himself. I know you mentioned we could 
talk for a few minutes to kind of put out our absolutely our absolutely and i learned a lot already i'm i'm on the the website and I, I never knew this side of the story about the the art making this is just fascinating i'm i'm going to have to make that pun that he created some viral or bacterial <laughs> art. <laughs> someone has to say it um <laughs> Thank you so much, thank you, Dana. And I understand that Punya will just continue, take it from here, as it were. Sure. Uh, thank you again, Vlad, and all the others who are uh, on this session today. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, joining you. And in fact, there's another story, not, not of Fleming, but of JJ Thompson, the person who discovered the electron. Turns out that those traces that he had noticed, and that's how we recognize the electron, had been seen by others and had been rejected by them as errors. So this idea of chance, you know, favoring the prepared mind that you're willing to see the world uh, in a new way, I think it's a really powerful underlying sort of theme here. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about myself, sort of paralleling what Dana spoke about. So thank you, Vlad, for that introduction. I hate those introductions because then it means you have to of the rise to the bar, I would rather have like, we got this random guy here and then I can say whatever and it sounds uh, smart and wise. So um, so my, just to give a sense of this thing of serendipity, you know, I mean, in, if I look at my career, my undergraduate is in electrical engineering. Um, I was always interested in art and literature and, and science and history of science and just engineering, especially the way it was taught in India, never really worked for me. Uh, so I ended up wanting to make educational film because uh, so I ended up getting a degree in design. And I think this lens of design is something that has completely sort of, I always, I call myself an educational designer rather than an educational researcher, uh, because there's always this sort of element of how can we build or create something new, something better. So that, you know, and when you think about this role from engineering to design to education, the movement, if you notice, is from the design, like creation, that's what engineering does, is build artifacts. And when you come to education, you're thinking about how do you design processes and experiences for your learners, right? The work that I do currently focuses a lot on how do we build systems and culture, systems and culture that allow for creativity, that allow for innovation. So that becomes a very interesting challenge because you know, when you think about the example that Dana gave, or you think about the idea of serendipity, what's really happening is it is a collision of ideas, in this case, in one person's head. So how do we train ourselves? So that's, I think, a great question to ask, that how do we train ourselves? Because this is by definition, and I, I see Ron is also here, you know, there is this uncertainty. So how do you design for uncertainty? How do you design? So, and I, I caught the back end of the previous uh, presentation. And I think that that sort of highlighted that whole point is like, yeah, yes, you want to go into grad school and you want to do something innovative, but how do you bring that element of uncertainty in, particularly in the systems and cultures that we have? And one way of thinking about it, that serendipity occurs when relatively distant parts of a network connect, allowing for novel information or novel framing. Now, it could be, the different parts of the network could be inside your head. In the case of, you know, uh, Fleming, that was the case, right? Which is, he was playing with this art. He was, in fact, there's this great quote that, you know, that what I'm engaged in is play. And I think that the power of play is that it allows for that serendipity to occur. Now, if you think of a group of people in unit and organization, uh, a system, how do we allow for these relatively distant parts of the network to connect and hook up with each other. I think that becomes sort of the, the foundational challenge, right? Is preparing the self versus preparing the collective. There is this famous story of Pixar, you know, where the design of the Pixar building, Steve Jobs, it seems insisted that the bathroom should all be in one corner of the building, even though, and they couldn't totally do it because it was violating some building codes. But his idea was that everybody have, would have to walk through the entire building to go to the bathroom and they would bump into each other. The software programmer who was working on something with animation would bump into somebody who was doing hand-drawn animation or somebody who was working on some movie and ideas like that would be generated. So, I mean, that was sort of his intuitively trying to make that collision occur. A more interesting example or a more transformative example is actually Bell Labs. Uh, Bell Labs, at one point, uh, you know, almost everything that we see technologically around us today has some precursor in the Bell Labs, whether it's the transistor, it's the solar cell, it's the laser, first communication cell. I mean, I could just go 
on and on fiber optic cable programming languages like Unix and C, statistical methods for quality control that are used by businesses all over the world, all emerged from there. And it was the genius of one man, uh, Mervyn Kelly. He had this idea for how such an organization would function. So, so I think there are some lessons that we can learn here about how we can think about it. So one, you need a critical mass of the right people. So if you're an organization that you seek to be creative, if you want a classroom, so, context to be creative, you have to have this critical mass of people, just three people. It's not enough ideas to bounce around. He was a great believer in physical proximity, which is ironic given we are all living in these boxes uh, of Zoom these days, uh, but that was his sort of idea. And that he would have thinkers and doers in the same, under the same roof. People who are building things versus people who are ideating, who are doing mathematical or you know more conceptual work. And he tried to find this harmony between these different disciplines and groups. And what he did was he physically designed a building where that could happen. And so he had this idea of what he called like architecturing serendipity, where people would be forced to bump into each other. So one of the quotes in this New York Times article was a physicist on his way to lunch in the cafeteria was like a magnet rolling past iron filings. So that as he would walk by, he or she would walk by you know, ideas would be sort of just bouncing onto them, whether they liked it or not. And that, you know, you, you cannot 100% guarantee serendipity, but you can make it more probable, more possible to happen. Um, and this policy of open doors and so on was something that he, he uh, valued a great deal. And so, so that's one piece of it, thinking about how do we design the systems? How do we design a culture which allows for that? So some of the things that I think are really important is important is diversity having multiple perspectives, viewpoints, having people who have had different life experiences, um, you know, makes a huge difference. So an example would be, you know, especially if you go to the Midwest where, you know, Michigan, where I used to live for a long time, all the uh, uh, laundry rooms are in the basement because they were designed with engineers. They're like, oh, the hot water stuff is here. Let's put the machines right here. But if you think about where all the clothes are, they're all up in the bedrooms, which is on the second floor. And it's only when women started coming in and designing that they said, this is really stupid. I, you know, we're spending a lot of time just walking up and down the stairs, carrying these baskets of clothes, especially if you have young kids. And I'm not glad we have talked about the fact that you now you have young kids, you know how many clothes can be generated in a couple of days. You know, I mean, it's things so that diversity of perspectives, uh, allowing people to interact from different backgrounds, I think really helps today. Which brings me to the point, the last point that I want to make today uh, about is the world that we live in today is increasingly becoming that of information bubbles. So I get whatever information I get from these select sources who are now algorithmically planned to cater to my interests and tastes. Um, I'm aging myself here, but I remember the days, you know, when the web was young. So I'm talking about late nineties, you know, when there was the sense of like every day you could find something new and surprising. And you know, David Weinberger wrote a book called The Internet, which is being small pieces loosely connected. And there was this sort of chances of finding something new, something interesting, a completely different point of view was very easy. I think what's increasingly happened is that the internet has become something which has become much more corporate, much more insulated. And so that we live in these bubbles. And I think that that's one of the challenges I think we have is figuring out ways out of this bubble because serendipity can only happen when we are confronted by ideas which are not things that we already believe in, agree with, like, and so on. And so I think an important piece to think about, you know, people have often talked about the industrial economy and now we're in the knowledge and information economy. I think really what is the scarcest resource now is attention. And how can we, and as educators, for us to think about how can we change the nature? Of, because that's, we just have 24 hours in a day. If you're online forever, you know, you still have 24 hours in a day, right? And so if the internet bubbles are this tight, I think thinking about how this attention economy and, and these tools, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or whatever, have been deliberately designed to grab our attention. And I think that if we have to value creativity, if we have to value serendipity, we have to think of ways of harnessing this attention economy for those purposes, not for the purposes of the corporation. I look, I see the time uh, that we talked more than we should have maybe and would love to open it up. We've raised a bunch of different topics here. I would love to see where the conversation goes. So uh, I will pause for now. 
Thank you so much both. Well, actually, you're you're not in in, in some ways going to pause because we're <laughs> we're going to continue definitely talking to you and unpacking these great ideas. I, I was very inspired. I mean, all both your points were uh, were were fantastic, and they really go along. A lot of the things I'm, I'm thinking about as well in terms of diversity and perspectives, and and we have some very interesting comments in the chat. I will I will come back to. But just picking up on on what you said last, uh, Punya, about technology, because we had a satellite event just before um be before the 24 hour craziness we're doing right now, and it it had to do with technology and China and innovation. And I remember I was struck by one quote there. Uh, someone was quoting someone else in a very Bakhtinian voices, you know, kind of paradigm but he was saying that if technology is the problem how can it be the solution you know and, and he was talking about the role the negative role sometimes technology can play vis-a-vis uh, -vis creativity and so on so I think it would be interesting to hear both of you and, and kind of your thoughts on how do we harness this potential of technology to do good in these terms and and whether it comes as a package somehow and, and can we really avoid the darker sides of it? I mean, you, you mentioned very nicely about breaking the silos and, and getting out of the echo chamber, but can, how, how do we do that practically with technology? What, what examples do you have perhaps of that? So I, I don't know about, Punya probably has more examples um, than I would, but that's an, an, a fascinating question. It reminds me of a conversation that I was having. Um, we do this, um, article series for tech trends and you were part of it uh, a couple of years back I think Vlad where we interview creativity scholars or or people who are experts on creativity from different disciplines and that specific point came up when I was talking to a um, design expert Richard Buchanan who really talked about some of the cautions and dangers around some of the different types of technology products um, being created in the way that you know certain affordances of our phones and our social media and devices are, have been designed with by corporations with the idea of keeping people on them as much as possible or or he just kind of touched on some of the different examples of terrible things that have happened through technological development and he really posed that as a an issue of ethics and design and something that technologies are um they're not neutral tools and making sure that people who um, are who all of us really at some level, but especially people who are thinking about design or in the field of technology are really spending a lot of time in the liberal arts area of education, thinking about ethics and humanities and the implications and thinking of the agencies that particular technologies have, not thinking of them as sort of straight up um, neutral tools that they just do whatever they want to with to serve the purpose of the corporation, but that different technologies have different types of agency that are assigned to them and different affordances that mean that they can do different things and thinking forward, sort of engaging in some futures thinking about the implications of what they create. Um, and, and having, you know, his idea was, and I think he referenced a, a short article by Douglas, Douglas Rushkoff of the Being Human podcast, um, who talked about who specifically kind of gave the example in his article, and I can share a link to it, um, you know, after this, or, or you can probably Google it and find it where he mentioned like, what if he did this sort of thought experience, what if Mark Zuckerberg had stayed in Harvard? And what if he had taken this class on ethics and thought about the implications of, of that? What if he had taken so and so's class in um, social dynamics and development and thought about the way that people interact with what if he had not just been thinking about like, let's produce, let's produce, let's create, let's make this and I can, I can make it and I, I'll do it because I can rather than sort of how we um, how we design and that a design can take a whole range of multiple paths, just like there's always multiple possible futures that we could um, conceive of and then sort of play out the implications and that there should be more um, training, not only specifically in design fields or technology fields, but for all of us who are kind of thinking about going out there and creating and being part of um, society and who are going to be you know, making things that people will be using um, in different ways and really considering the affordances of any particular project or product, you know, project artifact and thinking about how that could possibly play out. So he really kind of positioned it as an issue of um, ethics and in, in design and thinking about um, that just because some of these social networks operate in certain ways doesn't mean that they have to. That was how they were designed and that tools can do different things. So Punya can maybe um, tag on to that with some sure. examples. 
So uh, thanks, Dana. I also dropped a link to the business ethics article where we talk about the Rushkoff piece uh, onto the chat here. So, um, so coming back, I think, Vlad, to this point, the question that you raised, right? Uh, and that, that is the question of our lifetime in some ways, like of the times that we live in. Seems to me that first and foremost, you know, if you're an addict, you have to recognize the fact that you're an addict, right? I mean, so first and foremost, we have to recognize the fact that this, that we live in an attention economy where there are going to be these multiple pulls on our attention. So acknowledging that I think is step one. And then step two is then deliberately forcing yourself out of these bubbles. So for instance, I do all kinds of, you know, different kinds of, uh, what do you call them? Like info, infographics and stuff for the silver lining podcast that we do, which again, glad you'll be on this week. And the way I try to find images for it by actually going randomly on Google images. So I, I deliberately encourage the random so that it will spark some ideas in my head. Otherwise, if I have to look for the word creativity, guess what? It's always going to be a light bulb. You know what I mean? That's the image that Google is going to throw at me. This is what creativity is or ideation is, is a light bulb. Whether it's hand-drawn or a photograph, doesn't matter. It's always going to be a stupid light bulb. And so the question then, how do we represent ideas is getting deliberate about allowing that randomness in because these tools are incredibly powerful if we recognize a how they're manipulating us or how they are channeling us. And then there are always ways of breaking out of it. Um, China is a different example where, you know, everything is blocked or whatever, but, but where we live in, I think there are these opportunities that we have uh, to do that. So I think becoming sensitive to how our attention is being focused. And, you know, one of my um, favorite quotes is, uh, let me try, I have it written somewhere. Uh, this was from, um, you know, the surrealists where they talked about the random uh, meeting of, uh, uh, what was that quote? Uh, I had it somewhere, it's gone now. Of uh, umbrella and a sewing machine on an operating tape, right? That's this, it is this random juxtaposition that you mm -hmm. almost have to force yourself to do, you know, that allows for, many of them are gonna be failures, but that's mm -hmm. the only way that I think that this technology can actually be leveraged for creative purposes, right. at least in the ideation phase. I right. hope that helps answer the question. Yeah, ab absolutely. Very interesting ideas. And, and also in the chat, I, I saw there was a remark that it is very useful to think of technology as a tool, which it is. And, and we have very sophisticated tools nowadays, but we have always been tool makers and tool users and creativity and serendipity have, have always been mediated by technology. If we take it in this very, very wide sense, you know, of, of writing tools, for instance, and so on. But technology became much more complex, and I really appreciate this view of almost like competing forces of, of you know, openness and then and then constraint that exist everywhere in our life. But in technology, there is almost like this battle going on, and and then the ethical element as well that came in is very important. You know, how how do we develop this almost like literacy? Of course, people talk a lot today about these technological forms of literacy, but there is not only the machinery component to it, but there is a human social component as well. So excellent, excellent uh, thoughts. Let me check in the chat if we have more questions. And I, I want to open open the discussion up to, to people in the Zoom room. I know some people are watching us on YouTube. Uh, if they want to come into the Zoom room or ask questions on YouTube, we have um, Kate who's monitoring that. But if anyone wants to raise a question, do, do raise your hand and, and I, will, I will invite you to speak. Or otherwise, um, if you don't want to be recorded, you can, you can write it down in the chat. Um, let me give a moment to see if anyone raises a hand. While you're checking the chat, I just yeah. thought I would mention, Vlad, we actually, Puni and I have recently co-authored a chapter um, around uh, digital technology and creativity. And we used your 5A's framework as a way to think about um, you know, technology as a tool, just like you were saying, that that, that, mm -hmm. that affordances piece of it is really critical. And, and helping people to think about the fact that technologies have a kind of agency like any tool does um, and that we can potentially take the affordances in different directions but that the outcomes are not um, completely defined. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with affordances. I know it, it can be yep. controversial for some people because there, there are many readings of what an affordance is but it almost raises the question as well of 
in creativity, we want more affordances, more innovative ways of doing things. We want to, you know, but the ethical part is also thinking what affordances are not worth pursuing. You know, that's a, that's a mm -hmm. secondary question that just comes to mind now. So, I mean, that's been something that the link that I dropped here, the article yeah. that Dana and I wrote, um, you know, this is the interesting thing, like, you know, the fields that I'm interested in, creativity, design, we tend to think that they are positive forces. They are not necessarily so, you know, that, you know, Buchanan gives the example that the, the concentration camps were designed, you know, the processes by which, you know, uh, lots of things that are happening, which are not right in the world are deliberately designed to be that way. Schools are a great example. I mean, if students don't enjoy school, it's because schools have been designed a certain way where their enjoyment or joy in learning is not foregrounded in what we think as being important. You know, we are too busy preparing them for this future, which of course we have no idea what the future is going to be. Um, you know, so I think that, that the, the issue of values and, and deeper sort of um, principles that we bring to the work have, I think, increasingly becoming a part of my way of thinking about uh, these matters. Right. Excellent. I'm while I work through more of the comments, I think Vlad, a fellow, a fellow Vlad, not not me, raised the hand. Vlad, would you like to to <laughs> to voice a comment or a yeah, question? Sure. Um, it was more of a comment, but I I've come across something before that brings together um, what both of you are saying in terms of serendipity and kind of the further development that goes on within networks, uh, and it's that. Um, there is this whole long story of around 20 years of penicillin going from discovery to actually going into production. Uh, and I saw an article on the American Chemical Society's page talking about that. And even within that process, there is a lot of mention of serendipity and how some other people got involved who actually made it happen in the end. So I thought it's just curious that the example that you gave does actually fit not in mm -hmm. only in the artistic side of it but also in terms of how it was developed afterwards i can pop it in the chat if you want oh yes please. Right. thank you Glenn. excellent thank you and i i think sam um who's also uh with us but she she left a comment on chat and i know she she's uh, very much interested in the ethical dimension just continuing mm -hmm. a little bit what we've been discussing she mentions that she would love to hear more thoughts on um how you design in an ethical and yet open-ended way, um, and how do you make sure it goes in the right directions or not in the wrong ones? I mean, I, I think that 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 is an interesting, obviously, point because when we we talk about open-endedness, how open is that open-endedness? And if we come back to what's happening today in many societies, I mean, I'm I'm very much a dialogical thinker, and we always want more dialogue, and we we I, I think most of us here believe in the power of dialogue for creativity and and all of that. But there are some positions within dialogue that maybe should not be voiced in the end. So how do you how do we put together this? Anything could happen, and yet we would like still ethically for certain things to happen somehow, or certain certain kind of viewpoints to prevail. Dana, can I go on this? Yeah. 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 Um, so that's I think really thank you for asking that question. But I think that is sort of foundational to all the work that we do, right? Anything that we're engaged in. And from a systems and a culture perspective, I think the first issue is that, are we having these conversations about what our core values are? Like as a collective, what do we truly care about? And one of the things that, an example that I'll give is, I've been doing this series called Silver Lining of Learning for almost a year and a half now. And where we've been talking with educators from across the world uh, post pandemic, the organizations which pivoted well during this crisis, the moment the lockdown happened and, and, and so on, were the ones who already had a clear sense of their values and their principles. Because suddenly all the other rules of the game were gone, right? You can't bring kids to school. You can't have lunch. You can't do sport. You know, what was amazing is those organizations which cared, which said that we will go the last mile, which is who are the students who are most difficult to reach. We are going to start with them rather than the ones who are easiest to reach. Now, that's a deeply value laden sort of a philosophy that had to have been in place before COVID. And what that allowed them to do was to respond to COVID 
you know, the crisis much better than some other organizations which sort of put their heads in the sand and were like, we'll wait for directions from above or till the, you know, whatever, right? Um, so I think this issue that you, that is an important discussion that needs to happen in every group and every team. If you're a research group, that conversation about research ethics and authorship and blah, blah, blah needs to happen. Part of the challenge is that those don't happen and then you end up having all these sort of problems later. It's the same thing for any organization. It's interesting to me that Google had their philosophy or whatever their motto was, do no evil. And then they very quietly sort of, you know, faded it away, uh, which tells you something that they realized that being a company of that size automatically comes with ethical challenges. Mm -hmm. And that there is no way that we can always be just doing good. Because mm -hmm. what is good for one may not be for another. What is good for the bottom line may not be good. I mean, there are these, and I, I think it's, so I'm not making fun of them. I think it's a rec their recognition of their original naivete. And that, you know, so on, right? So I think to me, that's an absolutely first conversation that any group or team needs to have. Like in my office, in the Office of Scholarship and Innovation, we have a series of what we call OFC principles. And we revisit them every six months because we don't want them to be a bunch of values which are printed on and framed on the wall. They have to continuously be interrogated. Like, does this make sense anymore? Why did we say this? This is stupid, you know, and how do we fix it? How do we evolve? I think that's sort of a very critical part of any system or organization that you're a part of. I, I yeah. like very much this idea of, of kind of lived ethics instead of solidified you know kind of principles that, that then we don't talk about anymore at least at least there is the dialogue in the conversation and if I may just bring it back a little bit to technology because I I love going and, and I, I hope you you know I'm taking all of you on this ride but from from these bigger theoretical conceptual questions and ethical questions that are, are very broad and, and difficult to the pragmatic elements right so both of you use technology and design for openness and, and I guess dialogue within uh, the, the, the use of technology. And I, I'm curious if you have good examples for us and even some tips and, and practical um, examples for those who are educators or generally, you know, working organizations or elsewhere. What kind of technologies, educational technologies, would you say are very good to increase participation and, and how do they do that successfully? Do you have any tips for us? That's a good question. I don't know if I would say it's about specific um, technologies so much as maybe practices with technologies. Because um, for example, Zoom can be an amazing tool with your students, but it can also be a tool that especially we saw during the pandemic, a lot of teachers maybe weren't comfortable using it or, or it would just sort of try to do this one-to-one -one mapping of what they did face to face and just talk to the students and have them kind of sitting there. But then I saw some other really creative uses where people were, you know, using the breakout rooms and um, and the whiteboards and and having and really getting students involved in doing tasks or in or in using one of the affordances of Zoom is that you can be at home learning. So students might be doing projects where they're actually implementing or um, incorporating elements of their home environment into using tools that are around them. So it's hard to like give specific examples of tech. Puni might have some because you know you you work a little bit more with the technology team at ASU, but I always try to think about um, practices and mindset with tools as opposed to specific tools themselves. Um, so yeah, I wrote, in fact, I wrote a short piece on uh, online teaching as design, sort of encouraging the idea that all teaching is sort of an act of design and thinking about what you want to do with any particular task or what you want students to learn, what you want, what, what the end result is going to be, and then working back towards it and then thinking about how you can use the technology that you have. So for example, at ASU, we have to use Canvas as our learning management system. I don't get like a lot of options about, um, and there may be cooler, I'm sure there are cooler, better, more interesting um, tools that do a lot more than Canvas, but thinking about, okay, what do I have available to me? What are the affordances of this particular tool that I, that are there? What do I want students to be able to do um, at the end of this lesson or unit or idea? What do I want them to take away? And what are some interesting and engaging ways that they can do that through what we have available to us in the tool? So I think it's a great question, but again. Oops. Technology is playing a trick on. Yeah, Dana, we can't hear you right now. That can intersect with what you want. Oh, oh, you, you, you lost you there for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. 
That's okay. <laughs> so, uh, can I jump in? Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. So, I don't think really that it is about the technology. It is about the design of the system within which the technology is functioning. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a classroom or a con learning context which is which emphasizes community, which emphasizes, you know, students working in groups or individually, where it's not completely instructor led, transferring that to Zoom or some remote setting is going to sound and feel very different than if you have a classroom which is completely lecture based, right? And so it is the system which, and what that is encouraging or valuing is going to be, so it's the design, I think that's the critical thing. Right. Second point to I think remember is that there's a lot that we can carry over from what we know about face-to-face -face stuff into the technological space. So in face-to-face -face situations, caring for one another, recognizing one another's humanity, and you know, is important. Those things still carry value. In fact, they carry even more weight in this where we can feel much more socially distant in some way. And so more effort being put into that. So Amy G, Amy Jo Kim had a book. Um, I won't, it's about. This is a pretty old book about community in the online, like how do you generate community in the online space? Mm. But she has this nine principles and I, I can Google that in this, you know, and, and drop the link here. For instance, one of the things that she talks about that all communities have rituals. So for instance, in a family, it could be that we have dinner together every day. You know, birthdays are rituals. So if you see any kind of a community, whether it's a secular or religious, there are festivals, there are these, you know, so question then becomes, what are the rituals that we can think of within these spaces? We can actively design things like that. And they become a part of how, you know, this community sort of generates and, 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 and sort of sustains itself, right? And so it's thinking about things that we, we know a lot about how this can be done. And I think we get bogged down by thinking that this technology means something completely different. Actually, no, it can mean just transferring some of those ideas into uh, these spaces, they will play out slightly differently, but it is really the ultimate goals and the, the system and the culture that you're, that you're creating, which is gonna make the difference. Right, right, I, I, I love this perspective. And I think it resonates with another presentation before Dan's point about ecologies and this right. notion that things gonna follow us, you know, through, through so the there's a, hours. There's a great book called The Victorian Internet, which is about the telegraph. And it is hilarious to read because we now think of the telegraph as being, but in you know this old whatever dots and dashes, uh, right. Morse code and all that. But it was the first technology that actually shrunk the earth, and people got married over telegraph. People fell in love over telegraph. I mean, we thought this, so that's why the book is called the Victorian Internet, and it is a, a fun thing to read. And you know, I mean, if you think about prose on on a page can move you to tears, can make you laugh. I mean, that's as static a technology as you can imagine. It's black squiggles on a page. So I think we have a lot more affordances here. I think we are limited by our imagination in what we can do with these tools that we have more than the limitations of the tools themselves. Right, right. I, I, I very much like this idea that it's the system doing a lot of this work and not just the technology itself for sure, but maybe not us coming with our specific intentions to the technology either, because we're talking about serendipity, which is this, you know, kind of the, the in-between of meeting a certain technological tool. And there is a lot of openness around that. And I, I do appreciate this point of view that, yes, we shouldn't point to this or that technology because it wouldn't be in the technology itself that we find serendipity and creativity it's in, in the use. I think Ron um, had this same point, you know, kind of pushing further this idea of what would be the two first steps you might offer, you know, for people who, who engage with, uh, with technology and education. I think you already mentioned one of them being setting up some rituals, Punia, and I, I, I like very much this idea, you know, I, I did my PhD on Easter egg decoration and creativity, which sounds very an antithetical to, you know, the two to each other, but I, I, I am one to appreciate the value of habit and ritual within creativity and we can have a much longer discussion on that but what would be what would be a, a second so what how would you advise educators to approach any technological tool what, what, what should they what should they pay attention to for instance or or want to discover or enhance so i i love this question and um and i noticed that sort of 
Ron, he honed it on the idea of how would we invite educators to design for that, those serendipitous experiences, whether in digital or actual learning environments. And I think the same principles apply, but they just will look a little bit different in terms of uh, whether your environment is digital or actual because your, your tools, I shouldn't say digital or actual, digital or non-digital, um, because your, actual, your tools will be different in either. So it will play out a little bit more um, differently. But the, the, I think the principle that I keep coming back to with serendipitous creativity is the idea of sort of designing the surroundings and the practices in a way that will allow for that. And so many of the examples that we've seen of that, whether it's the um, any of the sort of systemic um, organizational examples that Punya gave or the example that I mentioned from Fleming are ones where people had kind of been engaged in practices or habits of mind or or environments that were set up in ways that allowed people to kind of learn to see things differently or to actively practice seeing the world in new ways. So the um, the Fleming example was one where he where he had created for himself the opportunity to kind of creatively play or engage in the arts within a scientific context. So at least in my creativity research, one of the things that continually comes up this was, has been this idea of teachers bringing together different, seemingly different subject matters in really new and interesting ways. So I, I remember talking to a National Teacher of the Year award winner who um, was struggling to teach the idea of um, movements in a text. She had high school students and she was trying to teach them ideas of what movements in a text like in Kafka's writing would look like and they were kind of not getting their head around it. So she brought in some musicians to talk about the idea of um, movements and music and what those look like and how that relates to or is similar to movements in a text. And some of the students who were musical or in band got in on the discussion and it really became this interesting um, space for kind of thinking creatively about how um, about how ideas can come together and kind of collide in ways that are new and surprising. Um, and all of the teachers in this particular um, group of sort of award-winning teachers that I had talked to, while they, what they continually kind of talked about was the idea of trying to give students space to play with ideas and combining subject matters in interesting and different ways, because we don't tend to see always um, music as related to math or as related to English, or um, I know there's a lot of work in STEM, but we still typically teach in ways that are very bounded, at least in K-12 education in the US. Um, and trying to kind of teach or set up environments in a ways that students had an opportunity to kind of to see interesting combinations of ideas and were in the habit of thinking in that way and also had opportunities for creative play. So with technologies, giving students, you know, opportunities to kind of play around with, see what they can do. Technologies can create, you know, kind of a safe space for trialing ideas um, and for doing things that they might not be able to do otherwise. So I think that idea of just kind of trying to continually look for ways that you can let students see the world in new and unexpected ways starts to kind of set the stage for that serendipitous creativity. Right, right. Excellent. And I, I want to thank you both, by the way, also for keeping keeping the chat going and sharing so many wonderful resources and answering in real time to comments. It's it's wonderful. <laughs> another another thing we can do with technology. <laughs> That's right. Excellent. Um, uh, so we have we have about 10 minutes left and I, I do want to invite more questions maybe from participants. If you have any questions or thoughts or just comments, if you want to raise your hand or just start speaking. Let's see, maybe I missed some in the in the chat as well. I think there was a, an interesting comment from Eva from uh, from earlier um on the nature of a system if i if i can trace it back now and and um and also sam mentioned something about that because i think when we come back to these ideas of what is a system and what is diversity you know diversity is intrinsic to every every context we live in of course it will be enhanced in some contexts and, and maybe not not as as visible if you want in others but i think the the questions were about yes i, I think i found it yeah. How do we reopen the inherent receptive, responsive relationships? So I think I think it's exactly these things that you've been you've been talking about, 
which is not only setting up the conditions, but, but kind of actively encouraging people to make use of them. You know, how, how do we make people receptive to the ideas of others? I think one other big thing that happens with technology is that, and it's in the nature of these bubbles and filters and all of that, that we, we tend to live in is that, you know, we, we tend to reject very different, radically different points of view. And, and in your experience as, as educators and people interested in creativity, how do you open up the curiosity for the view of others, even if they're they're so radically different than than your own. So, uh, I, and 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 I, I'm so glad glad that you brought that question back uh, from Eva because I that had scrolled by and I sort of flagged it as something that was a great question. Um, so I think let me let me see how to phrase this. Um, so yes, you know systems are these networks. That are already there, right? The question is, how do you bring that openness to that network? So I think some of it have to do with how you design the culture of that space, right? It's both the physical sort of architecture of the space. Does it allow for people to interact with each other? Does it allow for, are there spaces to have informal conversation and bounce ideas off? But also can we engineer or design it for those to happen, right? And coming to your point, Vlad, about how do we make sure that that curiosity and that wonder and you know so on is there? I think that that is, as a species, that's something that is just, that's who we are. And I think what has happened is, and I think this goes back to towards the end of the discussion from the previous uh, with Alistair that was going on, which is that we have sort of engineered these elements out of our system in some way because they cause noise, because we cannot predict or control them every uh, step of the way, right? And I think that what I have found in my work with teachers and with educators is that they want to do well, they want to pursue their interests. Um, I have story after story of, you know, one of the things that we used to do with when I used to work with these teachers is this thing called uh, a world of wonder, which is you have to find something in the world around you that you think is just intriguing. It could be a droplet, it could be why traffic patterns are this way, it could be anything. And you just bring it to the classroom and we would share and we would you have to do some try to figure it out. Um, I have an example on my website about once with cooking some soup, and suddenly a soccer ball pattern appears on that you know on the cover on the top level of the soup. And I'm like, where the heck did this pattern come from? Why this pattern? And turns out it has to do with the grill below the soup where the heat is coming from. Well, then one day I'm flying from a, back from a conference, I see these rows of clouds, and they are called cloud trains. And I took a picture of that and turns out it is because of the geography of the ground below. And I'm like, wow, it's the same thing that's happening in the kitchen is happening. You know, so it's these connections that you're making and we would deliberately push people to say, go and find these. And then these teachers started doing this in their classrooms and kids would come up with the most amazing question that they wonder about. And so one of the teachers did, okay, every Friday we're gonna vote on three questions that we are now going to dive deeper into try to understand. So, you know, and that way you are getting into, it, it is an open-ended, so that was the challenge. How do we keep it open-ended? But how do we, because you can have this, I mean, this is what I mean by designing processes, systems, and culture, is that you're actively creating these guardrails that allow for these kinds of conversations to happen. Not every conversation is gonna be mind-boggling or mind-blowing, but the chances of having those go up a lot more if you're allowing these things, these, these chance encounters to, to bump into each other, uh, to come full cycle back to the whole serendipity thing. Right, and, and also coming back to the habits and, and, and rituals idea, which is a very interesting, I mean, and I think someone mentioned this well in a comment, how it's, it seems paradoxical that we want to design for serendipity and, mm -hmm. and we want to you know, design for creativity as well to some extent and also have rituals for open-endedness, but but that is the case. You know, there is always a scaffolding of, of these experiences, absolutely. Did you want to add anything to that, um, Dana? Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I, I love that idea of sort of designing for, in ways that allow people to engage the natural creativity and curiosity that I think is already there. So oftentimes that gets squeezed out of systems because of the, you know, the uncertainty, uncertainty that it might bring about or the unpredictability. But it made me think about, um, we used to teach, Puni and I both sometimes individually or a couple times together taught this class on um, 
technology for teachers at Michigan State University. And we would always try to like kind of have a culture of like doing, you know, quick fire creative assignments or things that kind of put teachers in an un slight uncomfortable, not in sort of um, a risky way or a bad way, but just kind of pushing their boundaries or having to try new things or maybe make a video in a couple minutes and just put their ideas out there. Um, and whenever we would start the semester or the class, people would be very sort of anxious about, well, wait, you want me to do that? That I can't do that. That no, 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 no. Can't make a video in, you know, five minutes or can't combine these weird ideas and do something out of that. Um, but through just kind of this culture building and habit building of like, this is how we work as a class. We're together all summer and this is what we're going to do. And you're going to have things kind of coming at you. And there's you're, you're in a safe zone though. You can try new ideas. You can play with different things. You can play with technology. Every day somebody should, um, each person in the class should get up and you know share a different example of a technology and just be in the habit of that collaboration and sharing. And by the end of the summer, we would always see this huge shift in people just coming in, ready to jump in, um, enjoying it, playing, trying ideas. Um, it was a three-year program. So they would come back the same group in in um, summers after that. And you would see that this change was there and that they were taking it into their own classroom and that it was really engaging their students. So I think like in our mind, it was about not trying to change how they think about creativity or, or their comfort zone and then getting them to behave differently. It was about starting with the behaviors or the practices and that will then change and, and allow how they think to open up. So sometimes I think we try to convince people about you know, doing creative things or talking about it or thinking about it. Whereas if we're just kind of able to put people in those situations to um, have to try <laughs> new things or be creative after time, right. you, see, you know, behavior. No, that, mind. Thank you, Dana, for that, because I'm just reminded of, so, you know, there's this whole research uh, literature on the scientific misconceptions, mm -hmm. right, about physics and that heavier bodies fall faster than lighter bodies, so on and so forth despite being refuted by hundreds of years of science. So we would give this assignment, you have 45 minutes in your group to create a stop motion animation that actually leans into the misconception that actually makes the misconception even stronger. Now that's a really warped assignment to give people and many of them have never done stop motion video before. And you have 45 minutes to do it. And it just forces people to just come up with something. So you do think like people would lie down on the ground, hold a camera up there, and they would move a big and a you know, small ball from their hands. And whatever stuff is around you, there are no special tools, nothing. But what it does is it allows you to suddenly like, okay, I, uh, I have 45 minutes, I better come up with something. Once you do a few of those, like Dana said, what happens is it becomes a part of, so if we wouldn't give them a quick fire one day, they'd be like, what, no quick fire today, no excitement? Because then it becomes part of how you work and how you, you know, and, and, and I think the point Dana made, I think is critical. It's like, start with the behavior and hopefully minds will change. Giving a lecture on constructivism, a lecture on creativity is maybe the worst thing that you can possibly do. Right. Excellent. Oh, I, I'm, I'm loving these points. As a pragmatist, my heart jumps. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, both of you. I know we, we have only one minute left, and I, I just want to use it to thank you very, very much for this. I think this is an ongoing conversation, and thank you for sharing all these resources. And I look forward to chatting with you right in another live um, session, I think, right this weekend. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep going. It was really a pleasure. I think I'm, I'm meeting you for the first time, but I, I hope it won't be the last time. And then when we we open up again hopefully uh, you and and many others can come to geneva as well for for the live thing uh that we organize thank you again i'm gonna give oh, a round of you. applause <laughs> here we go thank you